Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Marion County in Oregon, the Pudding River is east of Mount Angel Forest and Water. It is not a massive river at the widest place, 60 feet. Depth is approximately 4 feet. It is in the Willamette Valley. It is known for small trout. The woods are thick. The river is not far from backwoods. The woods are on both sides. The river is full of large rocks. When we were there, the river was about one foot deep. It is not a populated area. The woods are fairly dark once you enter. In the summer, there are large sand spots. My wife's grandfather wanted to take me fly fishing at the Little Pudding River. He only had one pole, so I went to watch. We parked near the bridge and walked east up the river. He pointed to a stack of rocks and asked me if I knew what they were. I told him no. He said Bigfoot does that. I said, okay, sure. As we walked up the river, we saw them about every 200 feet. I waded across to where they were, and he said, don't touch them. After we passed the fourth rock pile, he put down his pole, and we waded across to the other side. He told me to stay put. He was gone for about 10 minutes. He came back and told me not to talk and for me to follow. We walked about 50 yards into the woods until we came to a big fallen tree. He told me to be quiet. I saw in the middle of four trees that there were small branches packed down and red-brown tufts of hair. It smelled like an animal had died. It turned my stomach. I also saw what I thought was chicken feathers in the den. We walked out and back to the river. He told me that I just saw a Bigfoot den. He was 87 years old. I never thought much about Bigfoot. I don't know if it was or not. He died three years after that. He was the grumpiest man I ever met. He was my best friend. I believed that he really thought what he showed me was the truth. I also noticed nothing was heard, but I found it strange that he had me wait on the far side of the river while he went to check it out. He didn't say so, but he showed me pictures of the big trout he caught there maybe 30 or 40 years ago. It was a sunny and bright day. A nice day. The river bottom is rock. The only structure is small. I believe Woodbridge and the road not far away. Further on down, about three miles, is a hole where some fish for salmon and steelhead. The water seems always in the shade due to the trees. My wife's grandfather, Jess, would not take anyone with him, no matter who they were. He hated people. Why he liked me, as he told me, was that I was not afraid of him and overlooked his grumpiness. He told me when he camped in the woods when he was younger that he heard the Bigfoot at night, and sometimes he saw one watching him fish. I asked if the Bigfoot knew he was there, and he said yes. He said sometimes when he hooked the fish, the Bigfoot would get excited and move its head from side to side. He said he yelled at the Bigfoot to go away, but it didn't move. <laughs> he said that those SOBs were like little kids. On to the next one. A driver was on the bend side of Sun River late at night when a woman and her husband were driving home after a late night grocery shopping, which they did every month, as her husband was a farm worker and got off work very late. The husband and the three kids were asleep, and the woman saw what at first she thought was a deer, as there were a lot of them around that year. What came out of the left side of the woods was not a deer. It was a very large, reddish-brown, very hairy man. When the car headlights hit it, 
the beast shielded its eyes and stopped in front of the car. Its eyes did not shine red like a wild animal's do. She knew it was a male, and she could see the male parts quite clearly in the headlights. She had stopped the car completely by then, and was afraid that it would hit them. The creature got its bearings and then continued to walk off the road. He had a short neck with the muscles in the top of the neck and arms built up like weightlifters. He also appeared humped back as well. The Bigfoot had a very strong smell, and his man parts were above the Ford grill. On to the next one. Near Grants Pass in Josephine County in Oregon, Scott Erickson, 13, saw a creature like a Bigfoot when he went to post a letter. On to the next one. At Davis Creek, between Davis and Odell Lakes, near Crescent in Deschutes County, two fishermen were walking upstream to fish for German brown trout and being very quiet so as to not disturb the fish. As they got to a 90-degree turn in the stream, they saw what they initially thought was a bear with its arms in the stream. As it stood up, it looked at them, and they realized it was not a bear, and it was seven feet tall. They dropped their fishing poles and stared at it. It appeared as scared of them as they were of it. After 20 seconds of mutual watching, it turned and headed into the tree line, but turned its head and watched them all the way to the trees. It had unusually long arms and extremely long legs. It moved very fast. On to the next one. In Douglas County in Oregon, I was about 15 and my friend and I went hiking in the hills between these two neighboring towns of Sutherland and Oakland. It was in the fall. I believe we were just about to go back to school for the year. It was a pretty warm day. We stopped along the way to take a restroom break. We were on some logging roads, or they may have just been fire control roads put there by the BLM. But anyway, we were on a curve in the road. We knew there were probably other people in the area, so we each posted a watch out while the other of us did our business. Anyway, I was watching out for her and walked a little way back down the road the way we had just come. When I heard a noise, I looked up just in time to see what I thought must have been a bear. It was just across a clearing, across the road, coming down a very steep embankment. It was near the top, very dark brown or black in color, and was crashing down the embankment through some smaller trees. In an upright position, I know it was not a man. It did not have clothes or anything like that. It was big and hairy. It started from the top of the steep embankment and crashed downward almost in our direction. I could hear the thump, 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 thump of its steps very clearly along which all the crashing of the brush. It was doing this in an upright position, taking huge steps as one would if you were walking down a steep hill very quickly. I was stunned for a moment, then I screamed, and it stopped and looked in my direction. I ran. My girlfriend was still around the corner, and she screamed too. I was yelling, bear, 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 and we both hurried off in the other direction. She asked me what I saw, and I told her. We speculated on it for much of the rest of our long hike. I had convinced myself that it must have been a bear. Later that night, I told my father about our close call with the bear, and when I told him what I had saw and what it did, he told me it must have been a man because bears did not ever walk upright and definitely not upright down a hillside. That is when I came to the conclusion that it must have been a Bigfoot. I'm the only one who saw it. My friend said at the time that she heard it I haven't spoken to her about the incident in a long time. It was midday, around noon. 
dry weather, very bright, sunny day, very hilly terrain, Douglas fir forest, some pine and other small trees. Some areas have been cleared. It was very near a logging road. We followed a road from Oakland that takes off of Highway 99 just after the Oakland curve and goes behind some houses. There are a bunch of roads back in that area. We used to hike the area all the time, but this time we decided to walk all the way over to Sutherland. On to the next one. I deer hunt in the mountains of Pocahontas County, West Virginia, with local bear hunters. These are rough guys, the kind that bear hunt in t-shirts. They told me a story of one of their hunts deep on the mountain, where few people go. They were up there one night, and their dogs got on something hot and heavy. They were trying to keep up, when all of a sudden, they heard one dog yelp, and everything went quiet. He said two dogs came running back past them. They kept going and found the third dog with its neck broken, head turned clear around, and it had been thrown up against a tree. I asked what did that to his dog. All he did was shake his head and say, it wasn't no bear. They all said they've seen strange things in those mountains. I asked if they believed in Bigfoot, and they said, call it what you want. But there's something out there that's big and mean and don't want people around. On to the next one. Dusk had found nine-year-old Roger Curtis and three of his friends in their makeshift clubhouse close to the banks of Canoe Creek in Henderson County. It was autumn and they had a fire going. They had previously gathered some firewood just down the creek where it passes beneath the road near Old Swope Trailer Park, and they decided that it was about time to go. They were, all in all, a rambunctious group of boys, and there was little to trouble them as they made their way back toward the trailer park. After all, they were right in the middle of the city of Henderson, Kentucky. What was there to fear? Nearing the spot where they'd left the wood, which was a little more than a forested refuse heap, the residents of the trailer park having dumped trash there for years, the group was surprised to see the dump site wasn't abandoned as usual. There, standing amid the old chair frames and the discarded refrigerators, was a seven to eight foot tall monster. It was bent over at first, like it had been rooting through the garbage, but it stood up on its hind legs upon the youth's approach. According to the witness, the thing stood like a man, but was covered in thick, reddish-looking hair. The hair was longer and bushier on its head. It was less than fifty feet away, but the light was fading fast, and they could make out no facial features. The troop stopped in their tracks on seeing the thing. Then it took off toward the tree line, running very swiftly on two legs. When asked if it had made any noise, Curtis replied, Hell yes. That was the scariest part. The noise it made as it ran away. A high-pitched scream sound mixed with what sounded like a crying. It was a god-awful noise. Let me tell you. Hard to explain, but it sure scared the life out of all of us. At this point, the boys started running as well, in the opposite direction, leaving behind the wood, fire, and clubhouse without a second thought. They were met mostly with derision when they arrived, excited and out of breath at Curtis's house and told their tale, but his uncle Ron was not so quick to dismiss them. They were obviously upset by something they'd seen, and besides, it was well known that people around there had been hearing some mighty strange noises at night. Unexplainable noises. He decided to go to the dump site himself and check out the area. None of the kids would agree to accompany him. However, so he went alone. He found signs of disturbed soil in several spots, as well as a couple of old refrigerators which were far too heavy for kids to pick up to have moved. Even collectively, 
which had been rolled away from their original positions. There were no other signs of anything unusual other than an uncanny silence which had settled about the area. All the youthful witnesses learned pretty quickly not to tell other people about what they had seen. Laughing invariably rang out in response. Names were called, feelings were hurt, and friendships were ruined over the encounter. The kids themselves, Kurt told me, never went back to the old clubhouse after that or anywhere else near Canute Creek. Even today, all of them still know there's a monster there. Ten years earlier, and two miles north, another beast man encounter took place along the banks of Canoe Creek. This one was also involving children and was even stranger. On to the next one. One day, back in 1980, when I was 13 years old, me and a buddy of mine were riding a go-kart together through the woods along the banks of Canoe Creek behind Woodland Manor. There was a dirt road we had back there in the woods that wound along the creek and we were going down the road in our go-kart when all of a sudden something big and hairy jumped out of the creek on our right and took off running down the road right in front of us. Everyone I ever told about this laughed at me and said I was nuts. What did it look like, I asked. My guide paused for a second. It looked like a hairy, humpback caveman, he said. It had dark, matted, shaggy hair on its head, shoulders, and chest. It thinned out to bare skin on its upper arms and started again at the elbows and went down to its hands. It had a bare midsection, real muscular. You got a real good look at it, I asked. Yeah, a real good look. And did you notice any genitalia? No. The hair started again at that thing's belly and was thick down to the top of its legs and then bare down to the knees and hairy again from its knees all the way down to its feet. Craig looked at me, trying, no doubt, to gauge my response to this. He could tell I was taking him seriously. I've talked to several people who've seen these things along Canoe Creek. What color was it? In. He looked relieved at this. White, he said, like ours. Did it run like a man? No, Greg answered. It ran on all fours like a gorilla. I thought for a moment as I drove. Could it have been someone playing a prank on you? How do you know it wasn't someone in a monkey costume out trying to scare a couple of kids? I've thought about that a lot, but I know it wasn't. We were going over 20 miles an hour in that go-kart flat out, and this thing was a lot faster than us. No way a man could run that fast on all fours, even without a costume. It looked back at us once, crossed the road, and shot off like a streak straight out of the woods. Did it have long or longer than normal arms? No, it was built just like a strong man, and looked like a man would running down on all fours like that only a lot faster. How tall do you recollect it was? About five feet tall, I'd say. Taller than the go-kart. That's another thing I thought about a lot. If it was that tall, bent down like that, it would have been way taller standing up than any man. Yes, I said. Around nine or ten feet. We rode on for a moment in silence. It was Greg who broke it. There's one more thing, he said. I looked back and waited. I know it's going to sound crazy, but its head was shaped funny. Funny, I asked. What do you mean? He shook his head as if searching for the right words. Well, you know how a man's head from the forehead to the back is more narrow than it is round? This thing's head looked like it grew outward at the sides. The head on top was flat, but the sides bulged outward past the ears. He put his hands up on either side of his head and cupped his fingers. Like this, you know what I mean? It had a huge, flat, rounded head. I've never seen or heard of anything like it. Craig and his friend were so shaken up by the sight of the beast that they had hightailed it out of the area and never returned there again. He had suffered much ridicule whenever he spoke of the incident, and he soon learned to keep his mouth shut about it. 
His friend never talked about it at all. On to the next one. In Douglas County in Oregon. This is a true story. I left Oklahoma City with my two brothers, Bobby and Jimmy, and a friend named John. We were headed for the state of Oregon in August for a possible long-term stay. After a five-day drive, we came to the small town of Drain, Oregon, where Jimmy had been a few years earlier with his ex-wife and child. After about three weeks, we settled in and everything was looking pretty good for us. A couple of months had passed, and one early morning in October, I got up and asked my brother Jimmy if he knew of a place to go deer hunting. He told me that he had been to a place a few years ago, just outside a small town called Yonkala, a few miles south of Drain on Highway 99. So, we took off to go check out the area, and he told me about it. We drove south of Yonkala, about two to three miles, and turned to the west on an old logging road. We went up the road for about two miles and came to a fork in the road. At that time, I asked Jimmy, do I go right or left? He told me it doesn't matter. So I turned right and the road ended at the top of a mountain. About two more miles up, the road that turned left at the fork ended at the top of a mountain about 300 to 500 yards away to the left. Jimmy and I got out of the car for a nature call. After about 20 seconds, Jimmy told me to look over on the other mountaintop where he saw something move. I looked and I told him that I didn't see anything. About 10 seconds later, Jimmy told me, look, I saw something move. I looked and told him, and that's all I could say. At the time, we saw a big black thing walking like a man. It walked over to the edge of the other mountain, the mountain we would have been on if we had taken the left at the fork in the road. It was standing there for about 10 to 20 seconds before it walked back to where we first saw it. When it stopped, it turned and looked at us for about 30 seconds, then turned away. That's when we saw a little one standing there beside it. We watched as they walked away from us over the mountain. They were about 300 to 500 yards away from us. The big one, about 6 to 7 feet tall and maybe 300 to 400 pounds, but very muscular. The smaller one was about 4 to 5 feet tall and probably about 100 to 150 pounds. After we got over the shock, Jimmy and I left and drove down the fork in the road and saw a man on a horse. We stopped and asked the man if his horse was acting funny or if he saw anything strange. He pulled out a big pistol and told us he was not worried about it. I think that the Bigfoot was looking at him when it walked over to the side of the mountain and looked down. We stopped in the town of Yonkala to get something to drink and told some of the people there, and they did not care to talk about it. So we left. I've always wondered, why me? Why did I see it? It was between 8.30 and 9 a.m. The weather was clear. It was an old, retired logging road that the trees were all cut down. On to the next one. In the Dabney State Park near Sandy in Multnomah County in Oregon. Kay Martin, David Brown, and Claudia Herzolt, all teenagers, were in a car when they saw Bigfoot cross the road and climb up a bank. On to the next one. In Klamath County in Oregon, on the Kino Warden Road, my brother and I were spending the night in our grandparents' camp trailer which sat about 20 yards away from our parents' house. We were staying there because our other set of grandparents were borrowing our bedrooms in the house for the evening as guests. Initially, my dad escorted the two of us out to the trailer and tucked us in. He locked the door as he left. That was at about 10 p.m., maybe 11. As my dad left, I turned on the light 
so I could look at a book that I had checked out at school that day. I laid there in bed and looked through the book. My brother was laying directly to the left of me in a sleeping bag. I was reading the book for about an hour when I noticed peculiar footsteps outside of the trailer. The footsteps were deep sounding thuds like deer make in the woods. I used to hunt, so I was familiar with deer sounds. There were always lots of deer around our house in the night, so I paid no mind at first. I was just thinking deer were walking around the trailer and on the lawn which surrounded the house. I continued to look through my book for maybe 15 minutes when I realized that the footsteps were not going away and were very close. This started to really creep me out. I reached up to the light and turned it off. At this point, I just listened. The footsteps continued in the vicinity of the trailer. This continued for about 10 minutes after I shut the light out. After this, the horror started. At this point, my story is probably going to sound like an unbelievable haunted house story, but you must believe me. After this incident happened, I never spoke of it to anyone outside the family for years. Recently, I've told my good friends and my wife the story because nowadays, I guess I just don't care if they believe it or not. I was laying there, listening to the footsteps, when suddenly I heard what sounded like fingernails or claws gently brushing the side of the trailer and the trailer door. I was petrified. This continued off and on for half an hour. The next event was really creepy. The animal outside started to claw at or play with the ceiling vent in the middle and the top of the trailer. I didn't see anything at first, but then I saw what looked like the silhouette of a long, shaggy finger poking through the vent above the metal mesh screen. It reached from one end of the vent to almost the other side. This lasted for only a few seconds, and then the ceiling vent was still and silent. However, the footsteps continued around the trailer for at least an hour more. I figured it was past midnight by this time. During this period, I heard the animal trip over the trailer hitch or something like that. This was confirmed by the ping of reverberating metal. The animal continued to stay within the vicinity of the trailer after midnight. What happened next makes me believe that this animal was probably a Bigfoot. At this point, I heard a car turn off the main paved road and up our subdivision's dirt road, about a quarter of a mile away. As the vehicle closed on our location, the creature sprinted directly toward what sounded like an eastern direction. What I heard was deep, coherent, bipedal footsteps. This creature was very heavy, but bipedal. As it turned out, the car coming up the road turned into our neighbor's driveway. It was indeed our neighbors, and they appeared to have just come from a party by the way they were talking. They were only mere feet from my brother and I, but we were so scared that we couldn't move or yell for help. Our neighbors went into their house, and I continued to listen for the animal. I could hear the thing walking, probably a hundred yards away, out in the forest and sagebrush but it appeared to be keeping its distance. I could hear the distinct bipedal footsteps. The creature did this for a couple of hours, and I was starting to feel as if it were getting safer. I went to sleep finally. However, sometime later, I was awakened by the sound of something literally punching or hitting the trailer. I heard the footsteps again up close. The animal was back. It walked around, the trailer as it did earlier, and then it appeared to go away and I went back to sleep. During the entire event, my brother and I did not move a muscle or even say a word to each other. The next day, we stayed in that trailer until my dad finally came looking for us at 11 a.m. We were two frightened boys. In hindsight, I remember hearing faint little toots or whistles as the animal walked around the trailer. Also, what is really odd is that our pet cat was meowing around the trailer at approximately the same time the creature was there. This lasted about five minutes. Then our cat was gone. 
It was a pine and juniper forest about two miles from the Klamath River floodplain. The incident occurred about two miles northeast of Bear Valley National Bald Eagle Refuge. Manchester, Kentucky resident David Blanton had no idea that he was about to have a brush with Bigfoot when he and a buddy were out four-wheeling just before 1 a.m. on one night in June in Kincaid, Kentucky. I was riding my four-wheeler with a buddy when we came to the edge of a swamp in Kincaid, which is a vast wilderness five miles west of Manchester, Blanton said. When I stopped to let my four-wheeler cool off, I heard a terrifying noise out to the left of me. I asked my friend if he heard it too. He was pale as a ghost and had the fear of God in his eyes. I turned my spotlight on and about 60 to 70 yards out in the swamp was a large hairy beast with yellow eyes. I'm six foot six and even at that distance I could tell this animal would dwarf me. I slowly walked through the swamp and trees every now and then stopping briefly for me to see it. It eventually got out of sight traveling up a mountainside. Blanton described the figure he and his friend saw as eight or nine feet tall and covered with brown hair. It walked with a slight hunch and its arms were very ape-like. The witness said that when he shined the light in the thing's eyes, they appeared to be yellow and the creature walked through knee-deep water without making a sound. The sound it did make was very loud and deep, he said, almost indescribable. On to the next one. A six-foot-tall, hairy, dark-colored creature with a black, bushy tail was reportedly seen by many citizens in Albany, Kentucky, the Clinton County seat in the fall of 1873. It reportedly had an ape-human face and left nine-toed tracks. Other sightings reportedly included the beast's mate and young one accompanying the creature. The sightings allegedly ceased after a local farmer, one Mr. Charles Stern, fired on the thing and apparently wounded it. The monster had reportedly killed livestock in the area and had previously acted entirely unaffected when fired upon. Though humanoid and walking upright, the presence of a bushy tail leads one to believe that this creature seen in this instance was something other than a typical Sasquatch creature. But no matter. Where there is one unidentified hominid, there are usually more, and other more recent Clinton County creature reports do exist. For instance, Another family vacationing near Lake Cumberland allegedly observed a dark figure which stood over eight feet tall one late evening in 1998. My dad and I were sitting on the patio deck on the front of the cabin when we heard a loud scream, too high-pitched to be a bear, one witness later claimed. My dad looked and saw an approximately eight-and-a-half-foot-tall dark figure about 75 yards away from the cabin. It was really big. The witness also recalled a strong smell in conjunction with the figure's appearance. It reappeared on August 4th, 1999. My 18-year-old brother and I had spent a lot of time making a walking path through the woods near our private cabin. Around 2 a.m., we decided it would be nice to take a walk on this trail we had made through the woods. The walk turned into anything but nice, it would seem, as the two soon came upon an eight-foot-tall, hairy creature standing on two legs and shaking a tree. It was eight feet tall, she later said, big and brown, very hairy. It had big eyes. It seemed to be shaking the tree to get something down from it. We froze and stared at the creature for a long time. The Bigfoot calmly turned toward us and began walking. I freaked and ran all the way back to the cabin, leaving my older brother behind. Her brother later said that he had felt glued to where he was standing. Unable to move, he watched as the thing got to within five feet away before his paralysis broke and he was able to run away in terror. Luckily for him, it did not attempt to follow. Had the creature intended to snatch the boy, 
he would never have been seen again. Tree shaking is considered by many Bigfoot investigators to be a warning to humans who have wandered into its vicinity, and other accounts of such behavior have been reported in the state. On to the next one. In August, a seven-foot-tall, hairy, bipedal, red-eyed Bigfoot was reportedly seen on several different occasions by residents of Blackburn Church Road in Shady Grove, Kentucky, Crittenden County. The first time my father and I were going up on a ridge to listen for some turkeys, said one witness who wishes to remain anonymous when all of a sudden, out of a pine thicket above 900 yards away, we heard something let out this awful noise. At first, we were shocked, then scared, because we had never heard this sort of noise before. It made this noise two separate times, and we left and headed home and didn't think anything of it. About three months after that took place, my friend and me thought we would drive through the road just to look around. It was about 11 p.m. and sort of foggy. We were just driving along when my cousin noticed two red eyes on a bank. I thought it was a raccoon until the thing blinked and walked across the road in front of us about 100 yards up the road. The creature walked upright on two legs and stood about six foot ten. We locked the doors and drove off as the creature disappeared into a heavily timbered thicket. A year later, my sisters and two of my friends got in his truck and decided to go look for some deer. We ended up going down the same road where we had seen the creature the previous years. The girls were riding in the back and just talking to each other when my youngest sister screamed out. I turned around just in time to see the figure of something standing about 30 yards behind my truck. I grabbed the spotlight and swung it around only to find that the thing had disappeared into the woods. All in all, the witness claimed three different encounters with the beast, two of which resulting in actual sightings. The strange sounds were heard at 6.30 in the morning during turkey season. The second sighting took place around October of the same year at about 11 p.m., and the third sighting happened at about 11.10 p.m. near a small bridge. The creatures are still being seen in the area, Mr. Timothy Cox, 42, saw one walking through a pine thicket just two miles from Blackburn Church Road. It was blackberry picking in an old West Vaco area just off McConnell Road, Cox said. I was picking the berries near a set of three-year-old pines that stood about 10 feet tall at the time. Some deer came running out of the pines about 50 to 70 yards from me to the side. They were running pretty fast. I thought it was strange that they did not even notice me, but were scared to death of something. I heard something else coming through the trees, just a few feet into the trees, near where the deer came through. I could see a dark brown colored thing that was moving the branches apart as it was walking between the rows of pine. This thing was moving at a fairly brisk pace, and the branches were popping as it went along. I said, what the heck is that? It was tall, nearly eight feet tall or more, because it was moving branches three quarters of the way up the trees. I could see an arm and parts of its body. It continued down the row of trees. As it got further away, I decided to get the heck out of there and run back to my truck a quarter of a mile away. It scared the heck out of me. In an interview, Mr. Cox added, the creature was walking fast through the trees, grunting as if it was annoyed, but unaware of the witness's presence until after he ran from the scene. The wind was blowing toward Cox, but he noticed no unusual smells in association with the encounter. Seeing the huge beast scared him thoroughly, he admitted, and he made no pretense of bravery during the episode. He did what most would. He ran away. He was, after all, completely unarmed, save for a small hunting knife. He described the creature as upright, about eight feet tall with long arms, which it used to push branches and limbs away. It had a stocky build and was entirely covered with long brown hair, he recalled. It just scared the heck out of me, he repeated. 
He estimated the creature's weight as 500 to 600 pounds. According to him, both he and his son were surprised while turkey hunting in the area the previous season when another herd of deer came running frantically out of the forest. One of them was a small doe, and it was so scared it actually ran into a tree, nearly knocking it unconscious. Then a terribly wailing roar erupted from the woods, followed by sounds of something very large walking quickly through. Like the deer, the turkey hunters fled the area. The incident scared his son so badly that he wasn't interested in turkey hunting at all now. Cox admitted that the sound scared them both. He never heard anything like it before. Later, he was researching the subject. He came across the alleged Bigfoot recordings from Ohio and stated that they were a dead ringer for the sounds they'd heard. On both occasions, he had heard the sound of the trees and limbs cracking and snapping loudly, suggesting that the creature was making no attempt whatever at being stealthy. Interestingly, Mr. Cox was first exposed to the phenomena during a family outing when he was just six years old. His grandparents, an uncle, and himself were walking along a nature trail on Pineville Mountain over in Bell County when his grandfather spotted a figure a couple hundred yards up the mountain and pointed it out to everyone. It was humanoid, covered in dark hair, and was standing behind a small tree staring right at them. At first, the uncle thought it was a bear, but there was no muzzle, and it stood upright with one arm around the tree, just like a man would. Alarmed, the group then beast a hasty retreat down the mountain. Despite having been in these entities' presence on three separate occasions and reacting in fear each time, just like the animals, Cox feels that the Bigfoot creatures are most likely a form of some unknown hairy human. On to the next one. My spouse has horrible nightmares every night in which he insults a skinwalker and then is attacked by a skinwalker. In the most recent one was the worst of them all. When he woke up, he saw that everything had been flung off the bed. In the dream, he confronted it front on and spoke the words, I love you, but he has no idea why he said those words. In most of his dreams, he has the ability to influence what takes place. But in these dreams, he does not. When I was discussing them to him a few weeks ago, he was likewise standing on the edge of the woods when he stated it out loud. Since then, he's been experiencing these nightmares. And every night, the woods beyond our house have been filled with the sound of horrible wailing. On to the next one. The river that cuts through our little town in the Central Valley of California is a popular spot for my buddy and I to go fishing, and we do it rather often. This specific location is situated within close proximity to a couple of the most costly homes in our city because it is located toward the outskirts of town. There are residences and the access road on one side of it while on the other, there are miles and miles of orange groves. The trip from the dirt parking lot to the beachfront, where we prefer to fish during the summer, is a short one that takes you past an orchard and through a couple of river washes on the way down. Today, my companion and I had been fishing at this location since approximately 5.40 p.m., and up until he departed for a few minutes, Nothing out of the usual had happened during our time there. He went back over what he had just covered in order to get some equipment that he had left upstream, since he didn't believe he needed it. At this point in time, it was either late dusk or early night at about 9 o'clock, and the flashlights were required in order to see more than 10 feet in front of you. While I was waiting upstream in the shallow water with my light and net, he was gone for 15 minutes, attempting to capture some crayfish to eat. As soon as he got there, he yelled out, Who are you? In a tone that clearly conveyed his concern for his well-being. 
I was in the water when I yelled back from around a bit of a bend in the river to let him know I was there. I supposed that he simply didn't see me and was concerned that I was going to drown or something like that. After that, he divulged to me that an animal growled at him as he was packing the things up that he'd left behind at the house. He aimed his light in the direction of the commotion, and there, staring back at him with orange eyes, was a fox. He saw that the animal's body was emaciated and of an unusual form, but he didn't know if it was due to the fact that it was ravaged by disease or starvation, which may also explain why, despite the fact he shouted at it and kicked dirt in its direction, it continued to approach him in a calm and collected manner. While the fox pursued him, he began to back up into the area in where I was standing for a few yards. According to him, he was so upset by the behavior of the fox that he started yelling out for me and running away from the fox when he saw it. I have no idea why he was so unnerved. That portion of the night seemed a little bit strange, but I believed it was simply a rabid fox or a fox protecting its pups from another fox. In retrospect, the only plausible explanation is that they do not have young enough offspring to defend themselves until the spring. Despite this, I was not really concerned about it since I had spent sufficient time in the wilderness and by the river to know the animals will engage in strange behaviors that are incomprehensible to humans. After he returned and described what had transpired, we proceeded to fiddle about in the river with our torches, attempting to catch crayfish and carp, as well as checking my minnow trap and other such items. Almost immediately, I was overcome with a sense of discomfort that was beyond explanation. It wasn't severe enough for me to say anything, so I simply put it up to being anxious about an animal or someone else in the vicinity I couldn't see. It wasn't strong enough for me to say anything. When I finally got out of the water, though, I didn't waste any time getting started on the process of packing my things up. My pal was staring up at the dry river wash behind us as I was collecting up our things and heading back the way we came. When we heard it for the second time, he was fumbling about for his knife, and it was the first time I heard it as well. It sounded like something at least as large as me was moving through the forest, breaking branches with its feet as it went. It seemed as if it was on the other side of the tiny island that is between where the river is flowing now and where it will branch off and run when it is full, around 30 yards distance. We often hear raccoons and possums down there, so this isn't typically that big of a concern. On the other hand, there are a lot of homeless people living in that area, so there's always the risk it may be one of them. But for some reason, neither one of us could quite put our finger on why we were feeling unhappy about the situation that was unfolding. Then, a string of shrieks that were unequivocally sinister put our worst fears to rest. The only word that comes to me to accurately characterize it is wicked. It was somewhat high-pitched, but it also had a guttural quality to it, as if there were fluid in its throat as it spoke. It was lifeless and monotonous with a breathy quality to it. If my vocal cords were totally ripped up and I attempted to clean my throat while simultaneously shouting, it may sound like what this thing sounded like. A cry or scream that is raspy in its throat and ranges from moderate to high in pitch. It began with maybe two or three screams that lasted for two seconds each, then escalated into longer screams and reached its pinnacle with a scream that appeared to last for somewhere between five and ten seconds. The cries eventually became shorter and shorter before finally stopping around 20 to 30 seconds after they first began. I have no recollection of what my companion and I were doing at the time that it was taking place. I don't remember if we looked at each other or not, but this sounded like no animal I've ever heard of. 
I am familiar with the hoots of owls and the howls of foxes, as well as the calls of the vast majority of the other animals that live in my region. Even more bizarre was the fact that it did not even remotely sound like an animal. It had the sound of death, as well as evil. The longer it went on, the further my heart sunk into my chest, I could clearly hear the fluid in its neck, and the unmistakable wah as it opened its lips and roared at us. This caused my heart to sink even more, and that's exactly how it seemed to be. It seemed as if it was hiding just inside our line of sight, yet shouting straight at us. My companion immediately gathered up his belongings, and in order to leave, we had to travel in the direction the sound was coming from. It wasn't fear in the sense that my heart was racing. Rather, it was a kind of sinking so bad that it was almost as if I needed to throw up. We quickly retraced our steps, shining our flashlights in both directions to examine every shrub and tree on either side of us, and sometimes turning around to look behind us. It didn't seem real to me. It seemed as if I had stepped into a terrifying scenario from a horror movie where I was going to die, or a nightmare in which I am startled awake and discovered that someone or something is chasing after me. In the forests I've been in, I've had more than my fair share of bizarre occurrences, such as many trees falling without any wind, peculiar whistling, lights in the sky, pebbles being flung at me, and so on. There was nothing else, though, that made my stomach turn quite the way that scream did. We finally made it up to the orchard, and just as we were trying to make sense of what we had just heard, we heard it again, a little further to our right. This time, though, it was coming from a different direction, but it wasn't yelling. Rather, it was snarling and nearly vocalizing, growling, or doing something else entirely. It lasted no more than four seconds, after which we walked the remaining 20 feet to our vehicles and drove away from the scene. That is exactly what happened. Now, I am wondering if this encounter was with a skinwalker. The fox was strained, but the roar and snarl were so overtly malicious and nasty in such a basic manner that I can't get the sound out of my mind now that it's there. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!